We continue our series in 1 Peter, and today our text is chapter 5, and it's our concluding sermon for the series in 1 Peter, our 23rd sermon in this small book. From the text, chapter 5, Peter gives his final instructions to the various people that have been upon his heart. And from this sermon, he is expressing to the disciples of Jesus Christ five principles of God's word, and they're given to you for your encouragement today. And I have five words for you that I think should help you as you walk out the door how to live what Peter is expressing today. So I encourage you, know the instructions and remain faithful. Know the instructions, remain faithful. I think the greatest, one of the greatest characteristics a believer can have is faithfulness. So many turn aside throughout their life. And it, it's sad. It, it brings heartache. Somebody who just remains faithful, stays by it through their lifetime. I think the Lord has a special blessing upon them. We are called not for the results. We are called to remain faithful. If I give you an uh, outline for this chapter... I'll share that in just a minute. So let me read the chapter to you, and then I'll give you an outline. Then I want to take a portion of that outline, and that's our sermon today. So 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. I'm not going to address those verses, verses 1 through 4 today, but they are to me, to your elder, your under shepherd. And by the grace of God, this is instruction for me how to live. Then there's the instruction for the young. Look at verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You ever know a young person who thinks they know it all? Maybe you raised a few. I don't know. But here's the instruction for them. Hey, clothe yourself with humility. Then the heart of our text, verses 6 through 11, is where our sermon comes from today. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering and are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then Peter, in verses 12 to 14, gives his concluding thoughts and it's here where Peter takes the pen himself from Sylvanus and writes this he says by Sylvanus a faithful brother as I regard him I have written briefly to you exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God stand firm in it she who is at Babylon who is likewise chosen sends you greetings and so does Mark my son Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. So to outline the chapter for you, this would be an outline for you. Exhortation and encouragement to the pastors, verses 1 to 4. Exhortation and encouragement to the younger, verse 5. 
exhortation and encouragement to the faithful, verses 6 to 11, and exhortation and encouragement to the brotherhood, brotherhood, verse 12 to 14. Those last three verses, 12 to 14, there are three people mentioned in there, and commentators have debated for years over who they are or what they mean. One is obviously Sylvanus, who was Peter's scribe, and from this point in the original language, the grammar, the presentation, all changes at verse 12, where Peter takes the pen himself. And then the woman at Babylon and Mark, his son, those have been debated, and I don't want to take the time today to go into that. But he's sharing his love for the brotherhood, for those whom he has loved. Having given you this outline for the chapter, our focus today is verse 6 to 11. You are the faithful, the ones who do not stop serving, the ones who do not stop worshiping, the ones whom, like the dispersed believers that Peter's writing to, under the weight of various trials, some while suffering, suffering greatly, we all are looking forward to the eternal glory in Christ Jesus when we are with him. And verse 6 to 11, which is our text here today, shares with us some five principles, conclusive biblical principles as Peter ends his letter to these dispersed believers. And I just see Jesus Christ all over these verses. I trust that today you too will see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in these thoughts. I want you to see, first of all, Jesus Christ teaches a position. He teaches you, as a believer, a specific and certain position. Verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. What is the position Christ wants you to have? Humility. Humility. And you know what? That's a lifetime of learning. Because it rubs up against our flesh. And we want to control, we want to dominate, we want it my way. And Jesus' instructions is, humble yourselves. There's somebody bigger than you are. And he offers to you a position for you to walk in humility. The position Christ wants is humble. For you to be humble. When you walk in humility, he has the controls. When you surrender to him, he leads you as your great shepherd. And somehow we get it twisted and think we can handle it, we can do it better, I know, and we never seek his face, his counsel. Jesus gives us the greatest example of humility when he surrendered his will to the will of the Father and left the portals of heaven as the Son of God and died for your sin. Something that he had nothing to do with, but he took your place. He shows us the greatest humility. And for most believers, this is our greatest problem. We use the mind that he created to think with. And we go beyond what we were created for to handle life on our own. We were created in the image of God and we are to please our master and walk a walk of humility. It's the opposite of pride. Humble yourselves. The thought here is so ironic. Because when you humble yourself, 
what's it say? He'll exalt you in your proper time. When you are humble, there will be exaltation. When you are proud, there will be humility. Because he knows how to humble us. And I would say to you, the very thing you bark the loudest about, you better be careful. Because God just knows how to bring that all around to the other side of the coin. And here's the principle, two principles from verse 6. Self-exaltation, self-exaltation will produce a humbled position for you. Humility produces Christ's exaltation for you. Do you get that? Self-exaltation will produce a humbled position for you. Humility produces Christ's exaltation for you. And in each of these five points, I'm going to give you a word. Here's the word for verse 6. Attitude. Attitude. You have the principles. You will be humbled. Either you humble yourself or God's going to do it. And it's all about your attitude. It's humble yourself. Reminds me back when we do communion. I always share this verse with you. If you will judge yourself, you will not be judged. I did something this week that I regretted. Now it was minor, okay? (laughs) But I was smitten. And it's like, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. That was just stupid. I shouldn't have done it. That's judging yourself not they deserved it look at what they did judge yourself and you will not be judged humble yourself walk in humility and in time Christ will exalt you it's a great principle yeah and humility is one of those things when you think you got it you're proud. You don't have it. Walk in humility. It's an attitude. It's an attitude. Don't let your flesh, don't let your pride rise up. Secondly, Jesus Christ is in posture. He doesn't only teach you a position to have, one of humility. He teaches you a posture. Look at verse 7. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. We don't think of it this way often, but the posture of Jesus is this. Come. Come to me. Look to me. Seek me. My arms are open. I'm here for you. That's his posture. Always ready. Always inviting. Always ready to meet your needs to help with your cares. We see it precisely here in this verse. The, verse, the word casting means to throw upon. To throw yourself upon. And he says, throw yourself over. All your anxieties over to him, on him. Any concerns, any worries, any cares, any anxiety, throw it over to him and on him. That's his posture. What a great Savior you have. 
He doesn't put you through these trials and the sufferings for you to walk alone. He wants to carry them for you. And you're to throw it over to Him. You're weighed down. I'm weighed down because I think I got to do it and walk it upon my sh- with it upon my shoulders. And he says, cast it over. Throw it on him. Whatever cares you have. His posture is this. Throw it here. Give it to me. You're mine. Let me have it. Let me handle it for you. The principle, verse 7, there are two. Catch this. There is a place for your anxieties. Throw it there. There's a place for your cares, for your worries, for your trials. Throw it on him. And secondly, there is a person who cares. There's a place to put it on him, and he's a person that cares for about what you're going through. And the word is this. Action. Action. First is your attitude, humility. Now, there's activity that has to be on your end. Throw it over on him. Give it to him. Don't weigh yourself down. Don't think you're carrying it all on your own. Or that you have to. The action is cast it over to him. If you're complaining, I preached this two weeks ago, three weeks ago. If you're complaining, remember the point, stifle the the complaint. It was stifle the gripe. I knew it would come back. Stifle the griping. Here it is again. If you're complaining, you haven't given it to your Lord. He doesn't have it. You still have it. Because you're complaining about it. If it's over on him, you have no complaints. You have a Savior who's carrying it for you. Number three, verse eight and nine. Jesus Christ is protection. He's protection. Look at verse eight and nine. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Not one time is Jesus mentioned in these verses. And you may say to me, then how in the world do you see Jesus Christ all over these verses? Here's how I can say that. He is your protector. The enemy is Satan. Right there, your adversary. That's the enemy, the devil. And he's busy. He's the God of this age. He's active. And he wants to devour the believers. Here's where Jesus Christ is all over these verses. Satan, the devil, was defeated by Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. It was prophesied, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that God would bruise his head. God would be victorious. From the beginning, we know that. But he's the God of this age. That's why this world is in such a mess. Because he's evil. He's wicked. He's out to destroy and to devour. It's fulfilled when Jesus Christ came, died, was buried, 
and he rose victorious over death and sin. Peter prophesied it. Look at these verses. We just had it in chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey. He went there and he said, You are defeated. I am risen. I am victorious. Notice another verse in Peter. Peter said this in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. Okay, our ways were futile, were empty, sinful, vile. Not with perishable things such as silver or gold. We weren't bought out of it. Verse 19, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. That ought to cause you to stand up and shout. I haven't seen anyone do that yet. The precious blood of Jesus Christ has purchased you out of this world. You don't need to care and worry and fret over where this world's heading. You have the maker, the creator, the redeemer who has bought you out of it, saved you out of it with his precious blood. Oh, what a savior. What a Savior. I give you another verse as our protection. Colossians 2. I love these verses. Paul writes to the church at Colossae. And you who were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. That is... I broke the law. Every single one of us have broken the laws of God. We've lied, we've stealed, we've lusted, we've coveted, and we could go on and on. That debt loomed over us. But when we come to Jesus Christ as our Savior, it's covered and removed. Look what he says. This he set aside. That is, my debt was set aside. It was covered. Nailing it to the cross, he disarmed. Now notice, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Who are those rulers and authorities of this age? The devil himself and all his evil, wicked angels. And he disarmed them. He won the victory. He won the battle. Nailed to the cross. Nailed to the cross. And the dead of Tim Coon covered with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. He canceled the record of debt against me. It's paid in full. Paid in full through the blood of Jesus Christ. So we know that Jesus has defeated Satan, the fallen angel. But it is revealed to us that he's going about this world, this old earth, seeking whom he may devour. He's defeated and therefore, the way to fight against him is with your faith. Look at verse 9. Resist him firm in your faith. Resist him firm in your faith. Now get this. When you're tempted to sin, whether it's alcohol, whether it's sex, whether it's stealing, bitterness, any sin you want to list, 
When you're tempted to do that, the Bible says, get out of there. Run. Get away from it. But the difference is this. When Satan comes and attacks you, and saying, you're a loser. Nobody wants to be your friend. This isn't worth it. Why go to church? When Satan brings those thoughts, here's how you defeat him. You don't run. You resist and stand firm in your faith. Your faith at that point has to be active. How is it active? Simple. Lord, you died for my sin. I'm a sinner. Thank you. You are victorious. Lord, I'm being tempted by this. Be my strength. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You start quoting Scripture. That's how Satan was defeated in the temptation of the wilderness by Jesus Christ. Quote your Bible verses. Start reading your Bible. God will give you something. He'll show you. You resist Him by your faith. And faith is believing in the promise of God. He said it. I believe it. I'm going to live that way. And Satan is defeated. And that's how you defeat him. Day by day, you stand and you fight with the word of God against the devil. Then at the end of verse 9, and this is a neat thought. Look at the end of verse 9. Knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Here's the great truth. And it's really neat. You stand shoulder to shoulder with believers around the world who are living for Jesus Christ. Listen, some of you have believers in Kansas City. Some of you have believers in Florida. Some of you have believers in India. Some of you have believers in communist Russia. Some of you have believers here, there, all around the world. You know believers. You heard of them. We stand shoulder to shoulder in this same suffering for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're no different. They're no different. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. You're not alone. You stand shoulder to shoulder with locked arms with those who have believed and lived for Jesus Christ. It begins with those listed in Hebrews chapter 11. And it continues arm in arm with those right to the very day that we live in who by faith stand on the promises of God. Amen? His word is true. And it hasn't changed since Abraham or Moses to our day today, August 2021. It's the same God, it's the same Word of God, it's the same promises. Stand on His promise. The principle in verse 8 and 9, and there are three. Be on guard for the enemy. Be on guard. He's out to devour you. He uses many various devices to try and get you to be tripped up. Secondly, your defense is your offense. Your defense against Satan is a firm, fruitful, active faith. Get in the Bible. Claim a promise of God. Stand firm. Resist Him. You are victorious already. Don't lie, over, lie down and be defeated. Stand firm. 
Number three, spiritual warfare is common and operative with all true believers. All around the world, spiritual warfare is operative. It's happening. And believe you me, it's in your life. You need to look at all your trials as spiritual warfare and deal with it, handle them spiritually. And you'll be amazed how you will have victory as your faith is firmly planted in the Word of God and the promise of God. Here's the word for verse 8 and 9. Alertness. You've got to be alert. Stay smart. Stay aware. He's walking about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Do you ever hear a lion's roar? It can shake you to the timbers when you're face to face with a lion. Alertness. So you have a verse on the end of your tongue. Satan? I know it's you. My sin has been nailed to the cross. You can't keep bringing that past sin up to me. It's covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. Stand firm in your faith. Be alert. Number four, Jesus Christ's provision. Verse 10. Verse 10, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Now listen, without being sacrilegious, if I could scratch something out of the Bible, it'd be the first phrase here. After you suffered a little while, <laughs> then God will restore you, confirm you. I could do without that suffering part. But you know it comes to all of us. So I chuckle. Okay, Lord. Okay. Suffering has a purpose. And that's what Peter's getting across to these dispersed believers. There's a reason. There's a purpose. And after you've suffered a little while, then the God of all grace. Then the God of all grace. Our Lord will definitely provide after you've suffered a little while. And really, the reasoning is, I believe, should Jesus be the only one who ever suffered for sin? He suffered immensely. We're called to be like Jesus Christ. We're called to suffer. And we learn more about him in our suffering than we do on the mountaintop. I'm amused, amazed, saddened, glad at the blessings and the great things that we have to enjoy in our world today. It's incredible. I can take my phone out, hit a button, one button, and I'm talking to my son or my daughter 1,200 miles away. When I dated my wife, and we were separated from Bible college in the summer, every day, I would take my pen after work and I would write her a letter. And I'd fold it up and I'd put it in an envelope and I'd put a stamp on it and I'd mail it. And she'd get that letter three, four days later in Florida. And she wasn't as faithful at writing, writing to me. And oh, how nice it would have been then if we could have text or call right away. Every phone call, I was paying money that I just earned hard dollars for. So we're blessed in our world today. 
immensely blessed. But I'll tell you, many Christians will be ashamed when we stand before Christ. Not because they had these great things that this world and earth has to offer, but because it was their focus, their pursuit, their life, their enjoyment in obtaining those things. And the Lord says, after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, notice what he says, he'll restore, confirm, strengthen, establish you. Keep your focus on Jesus Christ. Through the suffering, through the trial, he's going to bring you through. And he will restore, confirm, strengthen, establish you. Let me give you these words. Restore is to mend and repair, to strengthen. Our, the Greek word is katarotizo. I, I believe our word catharization comes from it. They go in and they mend your heart. Confirm is to support, to make firm. Strengthen is just another way of saying strength. And establish is to lay a foundation, to be unwavering. And what awesome promises. Verse 10, here are the principles. God allows suffering, but he will pull you out of it. He'll take you through it. Secondly, his call on your life is his eternal glory. Notice that in the middle of the verse. He's called you to his eternal glory. Why get so infatuated with stuff here when there is your home, eternal glory? Let loose, let go of the things of this world. Jesus said it in the Sermon on the Mount. Lay not up for yourselves treasures on this earth where moth and rust corrupt, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He's called you to his eternal glory. That needs to be your focus, not the goods of this world. Number three, third principle, Suffering will have no part in eternity. Amen to that. Suffering will have no part in eternity. Here's the word for verse 10. Admirable. Admirable. There are two parts of that. When you stay faithful to the Lord, in spite of the suffering, in spite of all the things this world has to offer, it's admirable. Faithfulness is what he asked of you. Secondly, Jesus Christ is admirable. He will pull you through it. He will take you through it after you've suffered a little while. Once you see verse 11, Jesus Christ has preeminence. He teaches a position, humility. His posture is, cast it on me, throw it over on me. I'll handle it. I'll deal with it. He's protection. Stand firm in my word, on my promises, because the devil's walking around whom he can devour, seeking whom he can devour. He's provision. After you suffer a little bit, I'll establish you. I'll confirm you. I'll firm it up. I'll take you to eternal glory. And then verse 11 he has all the preeminence. All the preeminence. The Greek word for verse, Greek in verse 11, let me read it in English. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. In the Greek, there's only four words in this verse. Him, power, eternity, amen. Him, Jesus Christ. Power. He's almighty. Eternity, amen. Close the book. Finish the story. Jesus Christ. He is Lord. Jesus is King. 
Jesus is our all in all. He is the Almighty One, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Three principles from verse 11. Jesus is the mightiest and the most powerful. Nobody defeats, Satan, defeats Jesus Christ. Satan is defeated. Secondly, Jesus will rule and reign forever. And third, you are on Team Jesus if you know him as your personal Savior. Do you know him as your personal Savior? Amen. Your heart should rejoice. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes, I do. And what's the word? Awesome. He's awesome. Jesus Christ is preeminent. He's awesome. Finish the story. End of the book. Jesus Christ is awesome. In power, in might, in rule, in death, in salvation, in resurrection, in victory, in love, in giving, in mercy, in grace. Jesus is awesome. He's almighty. He is our all in all. A radical group once threatened years ago to kill a prominent African-American pastor, Dr. E.V. Hill, if he preached just one more sermon about Jesus in his church. This wasn't overseas. This was in Los Angeles, California. Police officers were told, and they said to him, you shouldn't fill the pulpit Sunday. But Dr. Hill replied, it's your job to keep me alive. It's my job to keep on preaching. The deacons all sat on the front row, and Dr. Hill preached in the name of Jesus. Here's what he said, and I quote, I want to call his name out loud. So if it's my last time and a bullet strikes me down, I want to go out saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let's all go out saying, Jesus, Jesus. We learned in this book of 1 Peter that we're not exempt from suffering, but we learned where it comes from, how to handle it, how to please our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember the words of this book, 1 Peter, when times of suffering come your way. Get into 1 Peter when you're suffering, when you're in a trial. Dr. Don Wilton shared this note this week. Historian Everett, Everett Ferguson calculates that more Christians have been killed for their faith in the past 50 years than ever were killed in the first 300 years of the church's existence. That's pretty astounding, but it is the day we live in. Satan's busier than ever because I believe the return of Jesus Christ is soon. It's nigh. And we are to remain faithful in spite of suffering, in spite of trials. Let's all just go out saying, Jesus. How's all this apply to you? Your attitude must be one of humility. Your action in times of suffering must be given over to Jesus Christ. Your alertness to the devil Trying to veer you off the path of discipleship is critical. Be alert to his ways. Your admirable Savior will be with you and firmly establish you in his time. And your awesome Lord and Savior is worthy of your trust, of your worship, your love, and your praise. What a great truth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for his blood that covers and nailed the debt we had to the cross of Christ. 
Thank you for the victory we have. Help us to stand firm in our faith and in our life. May you have all the preeminence, all the glory, all power belongs to you. We love you today. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we ask it. Amen.